ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೋ ಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯಂಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿ ನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾ ವಿದ್ವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಸಮಸ್ತ ಜನಕಲ್ಯಾಣಿ ನಿರತ ಕರುಣಾಮಯ ನಮಿ ಚಿನ್ಮಯ ದೇವ ಸತ್ಗುಣ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ವಿದ್ವರ ವಿಲ್ ರೀಡ್ ದ ಇನ್ವೋಕೇಶನ್ ವರ್ಸಸ್ ಒನ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ಸರ್ಗಸ್ಥಿತಿ ಪ್ರಲಯ ಹೇತು ಮಚಿಂತ್ಯ ಶಕ್ತಿ ತಿಶ್ವೇಶ್ವರ ವಿದಿತ ವಿಶ್ವಮನಂತ ಮೂರ್ತಿ ನಿರ್ಮುಕ್ತ ಬಂಧನಮ ಪಾರ ಸುಖಾಂಬುರಾಶಿ ಶ್ರೀವಲ್ಲಭಂ ವಿಮಲಬೋಧಗನ ನಮಿ ಯಸಾದಹಮೇವ ವಿಷ್ಣು ಮಯ್ಯೇವ ಸರ್ವ ಪರಿಕಲ್ಪಿತ ಇತ್ಥಂ ವಿಜಾನಿ ಸದಾತ್ಮರೂಪ ತಸ್ಯಾಘ್ರಿ ಪದ್ಮ ಪ್ರಣತೋಸ್ಮಿ ನಿತ್ಯ Okay, now we'll read the verses that we did last time. So we're going to read verses 32 and then we will read also 33 and 34. Okay. Yajnanat sarva vijnanam shrutishru pratipaditam ಮೃದಾದ್ಯನೇಕದೃಷ್ಟಾಂತೈ ತ್ರಹ್ಮೇತ್ಯವಧಾರೆಯ ಯದಾನಂತ್ಯಂ ಪ್ರತಿಜ್ಞಾಯ ಶ್ರುತಿಸ್ತತ್ಸಿಧೇ ಜಗೌ ತತ್ಕಾರ್ಯತ್ವಂ ಪ್ರಪಂಚಸ ತ್ರಹ್ಮೇತ್ಯವಧಾರೆಯ ವಿಜಿಜ್ಞಾಸತೆಯ ಯಚ್ಚ ತೇದಾಂತು ಮುಕ್ಷು ಸಮರ್ಥ್ಯತೆತಿ ಯತ್ನ ತ್ರಹ್ಮೇತ್ಯವಧಾರೆಯ ಸೋ ನಾವು ವರ್ ಆರ್ ವಿ ಇನ್ ದ ಸೆಕ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಸೆಕ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ತತ್ ರೈಟ್ ಸೊ ವರ್ ಇಸ್ ವರ್ಡ್ ತತ್ ಮೀನ್ ಓರ್ ದಟ್ And in this regard, we started from verse number 28, right? But from verse number 31 to 36, we, have, um, we are seeing the lakshanas, the indicators of Brahman as Ishwara. Hmm? So this is where we are in the, in the book, 31 to 36, we are seeing Brahman as Ishwara. and in 32 we saw that this brahman as ishwara is not only the efficient cause as what was pointed out in verse number 31 but also the material cause so that ishwara is in and through this entire world of names and forms just like clay is in and through the pot the pitcher the glass etc and then in verse number 33 what we established is that this world is infinite it's absolutely infinite therefore the cause of this world must also be infinite so from this world i come to the cause which is ishwara brahman as ishwara and if it is truly infinite then there cannot be two infinities there can be two infinities so it must be that that one reality is appearing as this world 
And that one reality, which is appearing as this world, that is what we call Brahman. That unlimited reality that is appearing as this world is what we call Brahman. Then we also saw in number 34 that that which the Upanishads establish as that which is to be sought, that is also Brahman. And that we saw with regards to Taitriya Upanishad. So now today we're going to look at verse number 35. Okay. Jivatmana praveshascha. Jivatmana praveshascha. Niyantritvam chatan prati. Niyantritvam chatan prati. Shruyate yasya vedeshu. Shruyate yasya vedeshu. Tadbram hetya vadhareya. Tadbram hetya vadhareya. Jivatmana praveshascha. Niyantritvam chatan prati. Shruyate yasya vedeshu. Okay, so what does he say here? He says, Tad Brahma, that is Brahman. Iti avadharaya, a certain that is Brahman. What is Brahman? Jivatmana praveshascha means that one which pravesha, which has entered as jivatmana, as the jiva. That which has entered as the jiva, niyantritvam chatan prati, and the one who is the niyantra, the controller of the jiva, stan prati, the controller towards them, shruyate yasya vedeshu, that which is heard of, that which shruyate, that which is heard of where in the Vedas, vedeshu, that is Brahman. Hmm? So as we said earlier, this Brahman as Ishwara is something that we only can ascertain for many of us through the scriptures. So in the scriptures, in Chandogya Upanishad, if you remember, there was a mantra that said, Anena Jivena Atmana Anupravishya Nama Rupa Vyakaravaniti, which means that this Atman or this Brahman entered as Jiva. What does that mean? So we bring again the example of the sun with the uh, bucket of water, right? That sun, that pure consciousness is everywhere. It's definitely everywhere. But when we say it entered the bucket of water, what it means is now the reflection is there. The reflection is manifest. So don't think that Brahman enters into anybody. It's not like somebody entering into a house. Consciousness is that which is everywhere. The manifestation of consciousness in the mind is called entry. And the manifestation of consciousness in the mind as the reflection of consciousness, that is called entry. And that is the jiva, in its essence, the reflection of consciousness. So it is just that manifestation. It is like electricity manifesting in the light bulb. That's all it is. Huh? Electricity is there, it's all around. But when it, you know, it manifests through the light bulb, we see the expression of light. Mm -hmm. So there's no question of Brahman becoming samsari because some might think, oh my goodness, Brahman now has entered into the jiva. But it's actually, as we see, the reflection of consciousness. So Brahman remains untouched. There's no samsara, there's no hardship, trouble, dukkha, sorrow to Brahman because it's just that reflection of consciousness. Hmm? So this is what we mean when we say Jivatmana Praveshaha. Now, that Brahman also 
serves as the niyantra. Niyantra means controller. So Brahman consciousness with the upadhi or with the association of Maya is the no is known as the controller of the world. When we say controller of the world, we see every day around us that there are laws of nature, hmm? that there is the, the sun rising and setting, the planets are revolving and they're rotating, there's the law of gravity, there is a law it, to everything, how rain falls down, how water evaporates, it goes up, right? And things always stay in their dharma. For human dharma, most of us have two eyes, two ears, we have five fingers. There's a dharma that's in place, not only the laws of nature, but there's a dharma. The fish will have gills so that they can be underwater. The bird will have wings so that it can fly in space. Monkeys will have, you know, four legs so that they can climb in trees. So who made all of these laws? Hmm? Who made all of these laws? You and I cannot make the law of gravity. We cannot make the, the earth revolve and rotate. Huh? We cannot make the sun shine. So that totality, that consciousness associated with totality which governs all of these laws all of these wonderful laws that's why it's a cosmos that is called Ishwara and the nature of Ishwara is Brahman so Jivatmana Praveshascha the one who has manifested in the Jiva as a reflection of consciousness Niyantratvam chatan prati, the one who expresses as Ishwara, the controller of the entire universe through the laws of nature and through ensuring that everything stays in its dharma. Shruyate yasya vedeshu, this is said in our Upanishads, in our scriptures, like in Taitriya Upanishad, etc. This is what is known as Brahman. Okay. Now, next verse, verse number 36. Karmanam haladatratvam. Karmanam haladatratvam. Yasyeva shuyate shrutau. Yasyeva shuyate shrutau. Jivanam hetu karatratvam. Jivanam hetu karatratvam. Tad brahm hetyavadharaya. Tad brahm hetyavadharaya. Karmanam paladatratvam. Yes, yeva shruyate shrutau. Jivanam hetu karatratvam. Tad brahm hetyavadharaya. Tad brahma iti. That is Brahman. Avadharaya. A certain it. What is Brahman? Karmanam means of actions. Phaladatratvam. Phaladatratvam means the giver of the results of actions. Yes, yeva shruyate. And who is declared alone? Who alone is declared as that? Jivanam hetu kartritvam. And of the jivas, hetu kartritvam means that the one who enables one to act. Hetu kartritvam, the one who enables one to act. That is called Brahman. So that which the Upanishads declare as a soul giver of all the results of actions and the one who enables people to perform actions, that is called Brahman. So Brahman as Ishwara gets this title, which is very common, Karma Phala Data. Hmm? 
karma phala means the results of actions data the giver so how do we understand this so see every action has three parts okay every action every action has three parts one is the doer second is the instrument and third is the object of action so we say karta karana karma so let us say i am the doer i am speaking with my mouth that's the instrument i am speaking vakya vritti that is the object okay or i am the doer i am reading with my eyes and what am i reading i am reading a book so i reading with my eyes instrument book object now in these three parts who has the ability to determine the result of the action so just think about this does the book have the ability to determine the result of the action no right i okay let now think of this example also i am here speaking with my mouth on vakya vritti to everybody so the book or the object doesn't have that ability to determine the result the instrument also instrument uh, the tongue or the eyes that doesn't have the ability to determine the result because it needs somebody to employ the instrument so just my eyes cannot determine the result of action my mouth cannot determine the result of action the object cannot determine the result of action they are all insentient and on their own they cannot do anything now there is me who is a doer who is sentient huh? so perhaps i can determine the result of action perhaps but if we see that's never the case. So I am speaking on Vakya Vritti. Now, how do I determine who comes for class and what time they come and how many people come? That I cannot, I cannot determine. That is beyond me, right? The only thing I can do is show up, do my part and show up. But who comes, how they come, what time they come, what happens, where they are, that is something beyond the individual. So that expression of the totality, which as though is a calculation of the results of all actions, that consciousness behind that is Brahman. Hmm? So that consciousness behind this totality, which calculates all the actions, who's going to come, how are they going to come, when they're going to come, do they have right Wi-Fi? That is not in my control. That is up to, and that's why we say that is up to Ishwara. Because that entity, that entity, that karma phala data is Ishwara. So that is why if we understand this very deeply, then we will always have a surrender to whatever happens because it's out of our control. We really cannot control it. We really, really cannot control it. We can just control our effort. If two people are in a competition, person A and person B, they're in a tennis match. Now, well, how do they determine who wins? Person A wants to win, person B wants to win, right? The ball cannot determine well, ball is insentient. The tennis racket cannot determine who's going to win, right? So can person A determine or person B? No, it is up to Ishwara because it takes into account all of the factors. Huh? So that is what we mean by giver of results. So it means that for us as a sadhana, we are not the controller of anything, but we are the contributor. Definitely what we do will make a difference, but we cannot control any outcome whatsoever.
And so to hold on to this notion that I can control it, we will only become stressed. That's how stress comes. Uh, stress comes because of the need to control something which is uncontrollable. Uh, so it is a very beautiful sadhana if we understand this. Uh, then there is stress-free life. Just surrender. <laughs> so karmanam phala datritvam. Then the next thing he says here is jivanam hetu kartritvam. The one who uh, enables jivas, enables individuals to do or to perform actions. So one might think that are we controlled or what? Uh, are we controlled by some higher being to do things? Well, uh, Gurudev Swami Chinmayananda ji gives this beautiful example. He says, now think of this rowdy teenager. Okay, just think of this rowdy teenager. And it's the first time that he gets a bike, a motorbike. And he's so excited, so excited. And he calls his friend, his best friend. He says, come on, let's get on the bike. And now he, he's riding the bike and his friend is behind him. And first they're going a little, little slow. Then when he feels like, oh, he's, you know, he's wants to have a little fun with it, he goes a little faster. He goes a little faster. And then he sees that there are barely any cars and he has the Waze app so he can determine if there are cops or not. No cops. So he goes even faster and even faster and even faster. And meanwhile, so he feels his friend holding him in the back. And then after some time, he feels very light, meaning the friend had fallen down. Friend had fallen down. And this friend fell down and this friend took his best friend to court. Huh? <laughs> his friend took his best friend to court to sue him. Now, who is that injured friend going to sue? Is he going to sue his best friend or is he going to sue the gasoline? Who is he going to sue? <laughs> He's going to sue his best friend, right? But without the gasoline, the bike wouldn't have run. Yeah? So when we say, He to Kartrit from here, we mean that God is the gasoline. Huh? God is that pure consciousness without which we cannot do anything. Gurudev writes somewhere else, without which a sinner cannot be a sinner and a saint cannot be a saint. Huh? So that pure consciousness, that gasoline is God. Now, how we drive that consciousness, how we act and live and by that consciousness, that is on us. That is on us. But without it, we cannot move. Know that to be Brahman. And that is also established in our Shrutis. Right? So now we've seen verses 31 to 36. Now he's going to say, let us put this all together. Okay? So we are on verse 37. That Tvampadarthau nirnitau Tvampadarthau nirnitau Vakyarthas chintyate dhuna Vakyarthas chintyate dhuna Tadatmya tadatmya matra vakyarthaha Tadatmya matra vakyarthaha Tayoreva padarthayo Tayoreva padarthayo Tatvam padarthau nirnito Vakyarthas chintyate dhuna Tadatmya matra vakyarthaha so he says here, Tattvam padartha. Okay? Padartha. 
uh, artha, the meaning of pada, the meaning of the words padartha, of tat and tvam. So tat tvam padartho, the meaning of the words tat and tvam, nirnito, they have been determined. We have seen that through this text. Now, vakyartaha, the meaning of the statement. So we have seen the meaning of the words. Now the meaning of the statement, chintyate aduna, chintyate, chintyate means should be thought of, aduna, now, it's, it's to be thought over now, tadatmyam atra, and when we think about it, what will happen, tadatmyam, we will find an identity between the two, here where vakyartha, in the meaning of the sentence. Tayoho eva padar tayoho in the meaning of the terms. So the meaning of the terms that and thou have been discussed and finally determined. Now we shall discuss the meaning of the commandment Mahavakya that thou art. In this, the total identity of the meanings of that and thou is shown. Hmm? So let us look at this for a moment. So first we saw tvam, thou. We saw thou and thou, the literal meaning of thou is jiva. When you think of you, who are you, who am I? We are this individual, we are this jiva, right? Then we saw the implied meaning of thou or of you, which is that sakshi, that witness consciousness, which is of the nature of existence, consciousness, bliss, right? We saw bodha vigraha, we saw ananda rupaha, satyaha. Then we looked at tat, which is that. And when we looked at that, we saw that in, in the literal meaning, it means ishwara. Or usually we say tat, it means ishwara. But the implied meaning it means that same Brahman, which is existence, consciousness, bliss. Satyam, Jnanam, Anantam, Brahma. So now how the text will proceed is, it will go through how we get to the implied meaning of both words, because when we go to the implied meaning of both words, then we will see their identity. And now the student is clear because a student said earlier, how can I understand the sentence if I don't even understand the words? So the teacher said, I've explained to you now the words. Now let us go into the sentence, right? Let us now come to this sentence. Now, before we go into this, just some background about how beautiful this Mahavakya is. When we look at uh, different philosophies, the different philosophies in life, some of them are centered in tat, tat meaning that, meaning God. And some of them are centered in tuam, meaning you, the individual. Hmm? So let's say some religions or philosophies like Christianity, like let's say Islam, let's say uh, some of um, Hinduism, like the Vaishnava schools or the Shaivai schools or the Shakta schools, they uh, surround themselves on God. So their quest in life is to discover who is God? What is God? And they are in the Tat, Pada, the word Tat. So we will find that their sadhana, their means for spiritual development is bhakti, bhakti or devotion predominantly. So lots of prayer to God, lots of chanting, japa, going to the temple, the church, the mosque, etc. And this is where the beautiful practices come about. Now what tends to happen in this path is that Ishwara is always paroksha, Paroksha meaning that uh, there's a hard time to prove who is God and what is God. Because there are very few people who can determine that they have seen God. 
like Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, he said, I have seen God. You know, they, there's some uh, bhaktas who will get direct vision of God. Direct vision of God means God will come in front of them. So the, here, the thing is the parokshatva. It, it, it is hard for people to grasp because many people will say, I have not seen God. I, 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 I want to believe this path. I want to come into this path, but I have not seen God. And so this path tends to be faith-based. So those people who have faith, who easily can follow, who easily want to surrender, they will take up this path. And there's no issue with it. They will just go on faith. Now, but the beauty of this is that their Ishwara is free. Their God is free. God is not limited, powerful, strong, etc. So many people, many religions will follow this kind of thing. Hmm? Now, with regards to Tuam, the some philosophies will say, we're going to inquire about ourselves. We're not going to inquire about God, but we are going to inquire about ourselves. Like the Buddhist schools, like Sankhya philosophy, yoga philosophy, uh, they'll say let us inquire about ourselves so there it is a process of discovering who we are and there's no temples or things like that so if you go means there may be a buddhist temple but you will see meditating silencing the mind coming to who you are so some are just centered on that hmm? and their sadhanas like uh, for Sankhya, their sadhana, our spiritual practice is viveka, to separate the self from the not self. And in the yoga school, their spiritual practice is to silence the mind, chitta vritti nirodha, just to silence the mind. And in the Buddhist schools, their practice is meditation. So here now we will see that both of them and, and, and the, the so the thing about the Tuam actually, which is nice is that it's not Paroksha, it's Aparoksha. Aparoksha means it's ex you, you can grasp it right away. That you are beyond the body, mind and intellect. That is not something you have to take on faith. You don't have to take it on faith. You can take it on your direct experience, which is the beauty about also that Tuam, those philosophies which are centered in Tuam, it's very beautiful because you take it based on fact. But the thing is that this jiva is suffering. There's some kind of limitation that is felt because this jiva is suffering, is going through samsara, and one would really have to learn how to detach themselves. And another thing about this also is that they have a tendency to want to be away from the world. I want to be away from the world because I need to just be that witness, that seer of the world. I, I want to be away from the world. I want to be in quiet. So now when we come to Advaita Vedanta, what it does is it brings the two together. It brings the two together. When it comes to Tvam, when it comes to you, how Vedanta does it is it will first show us exactly who we are, exactly who we are, that we are free, that we are beyond this body, mind, intellect. It will show us who we are. And then it will also resolve what the world is and who is God. Because in other uh, darshanas, right, in, like let's say in the Buddhist school, there's no resolution of who is God. Right? So in Vedanta, after coming to who we are, then it goes to Tat. Now it says, the truth of your being is that pure consciousness. Now look at the world, look at God. The truth of the world and the truth of God is the same essence in you. And therefore, the sadhana of Advaita Vedanta, the practice is just be. That is a practice. That is actually our nature. So a Vedantin is not seeking to, uh, a Vedantin can engage definitely in 
praise and worship of God and go to the temple, church, everywhere. A Vedantin can also meditate, no problem, and practice um, Viveka or discernment between the self and not self. A Vedantin can do that. But they are never trying to run away from the world or run away from anything. Gurudev says that moksha is not freedom from action, but freedom in action. So they're not trying to run away from anything and nor do they have any doubts about the existence of, of that being, of that pure awareness, no doubts. So it is a, a beautiful thing when these two are brought together. All doubts are resolved and there is no mm, fear, no sense of wanting to run away or go away from the world. So as a sadhana, what, what can be taken up, or this is, this is the, the levels that we go through. Hmm? There are, you know, three levels of detachment in spiritual life. Huh? The first level of detachment, because when we talk about detachment, detachment, it is such a uh, loaded word. The first level is as a sadhaka, as a seeker. As a seeker, when we see, when we see that this world is full of sorrow, limitations, it's temporary, it goes up and down. When we see this world as Dukkha Rupa, it is like a place of sorrow, then our sadhana is to kind of just move away from the world and go towards the self. This is our sadhana. Once we see the limitations of the world, and this is for a seeker, we move away from the world, go towards ourself. This is the first level of detachment, detaching from the um, temporary and attaching towards the higher. The second level of detachment is we don't only see the world as a, uh, you know, something that's limited and finite, but we also see it as inert or jada. We see it as inert or jada. So there the detachment is I am the seer and this is the scene. So I am not all of this. I am the seer. This is the scene. I am just the witness of this. Hmm? The third level of detachment is the most beautiful. It is when I alone am. <laughs> the scene is that very seer. I alone am. And because I alone am, then there's no problem whatsoever. There's no effort whatsoever. Everything just is. When we're watching a movie in the screen and there's this uh, scene of, let us say, Dracula, well, you know, harming and hurting people, that all, all we have to do is either be in the movie, identify with the movie, or just sit back, relax, and know we are the screen. That's all. That's all. So that is where Vedanta has its difference. That is where Advaita Vedanta comes in. When these Tat and Tuam are put together, this is what we get. Okay? So now the next verse will be a little bit technical. So we will start that next, uh, next week. We will take that up and we will Try to now bring Tat and Tuam together, and then we will move forward from there. Okay, stop here. Om Purnamadav Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Gurubhyo Namaha Hari Om